The unknown author said, The TV is my shepherd. I spirit, my spiritual life shall want. It makes me to sit down and do nothing for the cause of Christ. It demandeth my spare time. It restoreth my desire for the things of this world. It keepeth me from studying the truth of God's word. It leadeth me in the path of failure to attend God's house. Yes, though I live to be a hundred, I will fear no rental. My television is with me. Its sound and vision comfort me. It prepareth a program for me, even in the presence of my visitors. Its volume shall always be full. Surely comedy and commercials shall follow me all the days of my house, and I will dwell in the house of spiritual poverty forever. We've had a uh, busy day so far, and we're going to, Lord willing, get to the Lord's table very shortly at the end of the service. But with the time we have remaining, I'd like to devote some time to this little mini-series that we started a few weeks back entitled Wisdom to Live By. And the goal of this series is to take the contemporary issues that, in my opinion, have flown way too long under the radar for the Christian. These are not necessarily the black and white ones. Those are easy for the Christian, the things we should do and the things we shouldn't do. These are kind of the gray issues. These are the issues that we encounter. And too often we proceed and process these issues no different than the rest of the unbelieving world. I want to address those issues with you. The overarching command I gave you is from 1 Corinthians 10.31, which tells us to do all things for the glory of God. And the all in that verse certainly means all things. So what that says is that everything in this life is to be a spiritual decision. There is no religious and then secular stuff that doesn't matter. It's all spiritual for us. Everything that we do, every word we say, every thought that goes through our mind is an opportunity to honor or dishonor Christ. So the goal that we should have as Christians, and this would almost be another whole series in and of itself, but I think a good one, is to know how to develop a biblical worldview, whereby everything we do and everything we think passes through the grid of Holy Scripture to the honoring of Jesus Christ. A verse that you heard quoted in that little clip that I showed you was a good one, I think, that applies regarding the things we are discussing. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. It speaks to this issue. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God. Again, that uh, 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 comes on the conclusion of what Paul said in Romans 1 through 11, which was the glorious salvation of God's grace and the doctrine of how we came to Christ. So based upon the mercies of God, God's mercy is not our own that saved us, based upon what God has blessed you with, therefore, Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That means you don't just worship Sunday morning, you worship God throughout the week. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't let the world, the Greek would kind of be saying, don't let the world press you in its mold. You live like that as a pagan. Don't do that anymore. But now be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We'll get to that. Use your head so that you can prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, two weeks ago, we started the series. We talked about time management. We covered the issue of busyness. Last week, I spoke about the choices we need to make regarding the media. And Lord willing, as I promised you last week, I desire to finish that message today. Let's remember the goal in this series today as well is to think biblically. That means It takes work, it takes time, it takes wisdom, it takes discernment. Words that most Christians have no clue about. It is not an all or nothing mentality. I'm not telling you to get rid of your TV. I'm not telling you also to live like you've been living if you're living like the world's been living. To live like the world is bad, but to to just react out of a um, a knee-jerk reaction or that's what someone else does reaction or a legalistic reaction is equally just as bad. We need to develop, as I said, a biblical worldview. As you see in your notes, I gave you some uh, numbers there to write these down. We need to use the principles of Scripture. Sometimes there's not specific commands. You're not going to find a verse in your Bible that speaks specifically to a Facebook account. But there are verses related to how we need to decide regarding whether or not we choose to use a Facebook account. So what do the principles of Scripture teach us, number one? Number two, we pray about it. 
We're submitting ourselves to Christ and asking him to guide us that we might make a decision that he deems his best for us. Remember, we did die to self, didn't we, when we came to Christ? Number three, we seek wise counsel from respected Christians. Number four, we allow ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit and by conscience. And number five, we make a God-honoring decision by using our minds. So after we've sought Scripture, after we've prayed about it, after we've sought wise counsel, after we've been guided by the Holy Spirit and conscience over time, we use our heads and we make a decision that we believe is best for us. And if we have a family, best for our family as well. And we don't press that upon other people because then we would be a legalist. You see, this takes work. This takes time. This takes discernment. This takes effort. That's why many Christians abstain from having a biblical mindset. Now, maybe after you've done all this, you feel led to abstain from some or all forms of media. That's great. Praise God. But you did it after you went through the process. You didn't do it to be a copycat to somebody else. You didn't do it because everything is evil and just you you threw everything away. You had a process where God led you to that decision. And if that's the case, praise God. But maybe you come to the conclusion that you can still participate in all or some forms of media, but at least now you have a grid that everything passes through. You have a submissive heart that has sought not your will, but the Lord's will. You don't need me to stand up here, brothers and sisters, on Sunday morning and tell you that media has the potential to be a negative influence in your life. You have unbelievers that will tell you that. I've never understood for the life of me how unbelievers can say, this show is dangerous to your child, and Christians still allow their kids to watch that show. That makes no sense to me at all. I mean, unbelievers have done tons of studies, and they will say that media can be escaped from or a false view of reality in your life. It can give you an addiction. It can lead to obesity, violent attitudes, sleep deprivation, Less interpersonal communication, shorter attention spans, less creativity, artificially induced stress, hindered reasoning, unrealistic fears, and on and on and on the list goes. It is an issue in today's society, and I think we're all aware of that. Uh, Young people have never been more passive. Few people are communicating to each other. Most people, you see them, and they're fiddling around with their smartphones, I mean, it's interesting when you get on any kind of public transportation. I was on the Staten Island Ferry, I remember it was like a couple years ago, and I was surrounded by a, probably a couple dozen young people around me, and every single person was plugged into some kind of media device. In the old days, you'd maybe have a conversation, you'd talk to people, how you doing, where are you from, where do you live, where are you going? Nowadays, it's either music, or texting, or social media. When I went to buy a telephone, or... I don't know, I'm still calling it a telephone. Is that even allowed to be said anymore? I think we buy these things. We don't even use the phone on it anymore. We use it for all the other gadgets. I went to buy a phone, and I uh, wanted to get some phones for my daughters as well, them being teenagers, just more for safety purposes, and one to call for a ride home from athletic practice, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, you're going to need the text messaging plan. And I'm thinking, um, well, what's the, the, the lowest one I can go with? And, uh, oh, you need this unlimited text messaging. I say, why do I need unlimited? I mean, what is it, two text messages maybe a day? And the person almost dropped her jaw and laughing at me. (laughs) The average child will send in one month 3,339 text messages. Not my kids, but the average kid will. (laughs) At least at the best of my knowledge. Some kids bring their phones to bed with them and they sleep on their phone because they don't want to miss anything. Never before have young people been able to screen out parents so thoroughly. Never before, especially if they have a smartphone and it's connected to any kind of internet access service that they have power tools in their hand and they are one click away from something watching horrible. The average American will spend 53 hours each week in front of the screen. 53 hours each week. Adult men are deadbeats, especially the men. Some of the women aren't much better, but mainly the men because they sit around oftentimes and their parents basement still, after they ride to their house in their old BMX bike and they're playing video games to the wee hours of the morning. 
Studies have proven that if you get involved in these video games, some of these games are so realistic, so complex. I mean, you are building cities, you are destroying civilizations, you are landing jumbo jets, that you actually, studies have proven this, it tricks your brain in thinking you actually accomplished something. And they walk away and say, what are you talking about? Look what I just did. I'm the king of the world. They have no idea how to be a father or a husband. Lyrics in many of the songs now are X-rated. Had a lady approach me last week, and she came up to me very humbly, and she said, uh, I am addicted to television. I said, why do you come to that conclusion? And she spelled it out for me. I was, I was amazed that someone could be that engrossed with the television set. Praise God, she had the ability to admit it. I wonder how many of us are struggling with some kind of media addiction as well. And it's not, folks, just the time that we spend in front of our little gadgets that's a colossal waste of time. But it's also the, the garbage that gets pumped into our brains. You know, as a Christian, we are called to implement Philippians 4.8, which says that we are to dwell. That's a great word. It doesn't just say consider. It doesn't say look at it once a day in your 20-minute Bible reading you do every morning. It says to dwell. That gives the idea of, of processing something, meditating on something, allowing something to be deeply rooted within you. Dwell on the things, Philippians 4, 8, that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and of good repute and worthy of praise. Are we filling our minds with biblical material or are we pumping our brains with that which diametrically opposes biblical values? I hate to overstate the obvious one on this, but if you really seek to develop a biblical mind and make wise choices in this fallen world, I don't think poor media selections are the way to go. It's taking you in the wrong direction, isn't it? It's guarding your mind. So you can dwell on the things that are good. Ken Hughes, in his uh, book, Disciplines of a Godly Man, you know, a lot of the gentlemen in the church have read that book, and if you haven't, you need to, said it's impossible for any Christian who spends the bulk of his evenings month after month, week upon week, and day in and day out watching the major television networks or contemporary videos to have a Christian mind. This is always true of all Christians. In every situation, a biblical mental program cannot coexist with worldly programming. John Piper adds, It astonishes me how many Christians watch the same banal, empty, silly, trivial, suggestive, and modest TV shows that most unbelievers watch. And then they wonder why their spiritual lives are weak and their worship experience is shallow with no intensity. That's kind of a little bit of a review from last week. So uh, let me move on. I promised you last week I would take some time to talk specifically about this issue of social media. And a lot of you come up to me and said you're glad to hear that because it's something we haven't covered much and it's something that is huge in most people's lives. Talking about things like Facebook, Twitter, the list continues there as well. Studies have shown 700 billion minutes is how much Facebook's 1.2 billion active users spend on the site every single month. Every month people spend the equivalent of 1.3 billion years on Facebook. Every month, 1.3 billion years is devoted to Facebook. That's the equivalence of nearly 18,000 lifetimes. More than half of Facebook's users log in every single day. So does that mean, here we go now, that it's all bad? My answer to that is, I don't think so. I'm not telling you to get rid of your Facebook account. I'm not telling you to close out. I don't think so. I have a Facebook account. I don't use it very often, but I have one. Facebook can have a lot of good purposes as well. It can help us connect with lost friends. It can help us maintain and stay in touch with other friends. We can post things and read about things that are thought-provoking and and, and excellent. We can encourage and equip other Christians with what we put on our Facebook page. We can even share the gospel to hundreds of people that are only now one click away. As a matter of fact, one of the best books I've read on leadership is by a guy named Al Mohler, probably one of the greatest minds today in the Christian church, and he made this point. He said, if a leader is not leading in the digital world, his leadership is, by definition, limited to those who ignore or neglect that world. That population is shrinking every single minute. What he's basically saying is, if you're not in the digital world as a leader, you're really kind of foolish because you're running out of people to minister to. Ministry is happening there 
as ministers, we need to be there as well. It goes on to say, if you are satisfied to lead from the past, stay out of the digital world. If you want to influence the future, brace yourself and get in the fast lane. But as it is with all media, if we are not careful, the pitfalls very easily begin to outweigh the benefits. Let me do this. I put these in your your, uh, notes for today's sermon. Let me give you 10 Bible verses. We want to follow the Bible, right? We're a Bible church. We believe God speaks to us through the Bible. So we want to follow what the Bible says. So I'm just going to pick out 10 Bible verses and see how social media pertains to those verses. Again, the goal is not to say all social media is bad. The goal is not to get you to close out your Twitter account. The goal is to get you, if you still desire to proceed with social media, to do it in such a way that honors Christ and follows Scripture, right? That's what we want to do. So I don't want to just preach here as some angry, I almost said ugly, that would apply as well, ugly and angry, fundamentalist preacher. I want to give you Scripture and let the Holy Spirit work in your hearts and allow you to make a responsible decision. All right, here we go. Colossians 2.7, number one tells us to be overflowing with gratitude. I think you're gonna, some of these things are going to catch you by surprise. Overflowing with gratitude. Social media, and I saw someone make a post along these lines yesterday, very ironic, will give you the impression that everyone else on social media, as you read their posts, is perfect. What do they do? The same thing we do. If I need a new profile picture and I've gone six months without updating my profile picture, I might look at the pictures I have over the last six months and probably choose the best one. If I'm going to put something up on Facebook, I'm going to take some time to think about what I want to say and I'm going to make sure my comments are the the exact comments that I want to come from my lips. Most people, most normal people, process that way. We don't put up an ugly picture. We put up the best picture of ourselves. We don't put up ridiculous stuff unless we just want to be silly. We put up stuff that makes sense and things that we've thought through. If we're not careful, everyone on Facebook will appear to be perfect. And as we start looking at all of their accounts, we will start to feel very imperfect because we don't measure up to those standards. For example, it can lead us to apathy. Every time I see them, They put a family picture up. Everyone is having so much fun. Every family picture, everyone is smiling. My family doesn't have as much fun as them. You see, it's unrealistic because every family has tough times. No family is running around with a smile plastered on their face 24 hours a day. But that's the pictures we show. It could lead to discontentment. Wow. Wow. Her son won a karate award. He's a black belt now. She's a gymnast that's preparing for the Olympics, her daughter. Uh, That guy's kid's now valedictorian of his school, right? That's what people post. And I look at my family and say, my family doesn't measure up to those standards. Discontent can lead to ungratefulness. Wow, look at that nice vacation they had in the Caribbean. I've never been to the Caribbean. I've never been to Disney World. You see how dangerous this can be? We are overflowing with gratitude. Can you use social media and still overflow with gratitude? That could be tough. Matthew 12, 36, number two. Jesus said that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. Social media is a fertile tool for careless and unrestrained words. It is also a haven to receive and spread gossip very easily. Number three, 1 Peter 1.22 calls us to fervently love one another from the heart. Fervently love one another from the heart. Social media encourages less face-to-face interactions. What happens is we get plugged into the, the, the social media network and we know, only peop- we know people only from behind a computer screen. And although we think we have a lot of friends, and we really got to think through that word friends on Facebook, what does it really mean to have a friend? If a friend is I dialogue with that person through a computer screen, maybe once every three months, and the relationship is very superficial, they might be on Facebook your friend, but in real life they're not your friend. 
They are almost, in a sense, pseudo-friendships. You got hundreds, maybe thousands of friends, but you really don't know any of them very well. It's shallow. Hundreds of hours with shallow friends exchanging only little sound bites. Is that really fervently loving one another from the heart? You make the decision. Number four, Colossians 1.10. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. To please Christ in all respects. What social media does, if we're not careful, is it encourages us to live a fantasy life. You are always more interesting to other people on Facebook and Twitter than you are in real life. And what happens is people get immersed in this phony agenda whereby now the screen becomes their stage. And they're portraying themselves to other people not as they really are. That's not pleasing to Christ. That's not the real you. That's not being genuine. That's showing off. And that's living a fantasy life. Number five, Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. What social media has done is it has produced a whole generation of people that I'm calling tough guy syndromes. I've dealt with these people. It's amazing what people can say when they hide behind the confines of a computer screen. They're oftentimes so big, so bold, and so brave, but they never want to meet face-to-face. They're cowardly. They're timid. And it all becomes arguing behind a computer screen. No one wants to meet face-to-face anymore. The days of face-to-face conversations, the days of sitting down with someone that you have a difference with and working through the issues gently, humbly, considering the other person's perspective, reading conversational tone, looking at body language, face-to-face interaction are very sadly disappearing very rapidly. And that's a shame. Number six, 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, keeping sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your minds for action. Are you as a Christian prepared for action? Are you fighting a good fight? Are you engaged in spiritual warfare? There is no place for mediocrity or laziness in the life of a Christian. Facebook and Twitter and all the forms of social media can easily contribute to that. What it does quite often is it pushes us to get engaged in trivial stuff. Have you ever looked at your Facebook page and in the upper kind of right-hand side, I think it's the right-hand side, maybe it's the left, um, it says, I think it's blue letters, stories that are trending. And there's usually three headlines there. Have you ever read what those headlines say? Have you ever read that? I mean, it's, it's all the real important stuff, you know that? Like the latest Hollywood release. That's what's trending. That's what people are talking about. Or even better, uh, uh, celebrity gossip. Who's marrying who? Who's divorcing who? Who's cheated on who? That's all it's there for the most part. I mean, even, and I'm guilty of it as well, you know, you, you, you develop a, a few hundred friends and you can't read every single post, so you're on the, the main page there and you're just flipping through on your smartphone and you're seeing all the real special stuff like, you know, um, what a person ate for breakfast and you're camping out on that and you're looking at her scrambled eggs, you know, with the peppers and the ham that's mixed in. And then you got 20 minutes of dialogue with 15 comments that people have made upon what they had for breakfast. Does that give anyone a headache or is that just me? Just thinking about it gives me a headache. Or, you know, what someone's watching on TV right now. And, and that's the stuff you, you get glued to and all the, the important stuff when people post like a, a meaningful post of a link that you can, you know, click on or a good blog and you can read and it might actually take you a whole three minutes to read it. You just skip right over that, don't you? It's funny. I mean, I could put something up and I'll get 100 likes or something and then I put an article up about abortion or something like that and it gets three. And I'm thinking, wow, that's weird because like 85% of my friends are all believers. Just doesn't matter. We just fly through that stuff. That's a waste of my time. And what's happening is we have a society today where the important matters of life are vanishing. 
I mean, most people are just voting because of coolness or, or, or what else someone else is doing. But are they really studying the candidates? Do they really know the issues? Do they know what's happening in the world? Do they know how the church is being persecuted overseas? We don't know any of those things as Christians because we're caught up in the trivial stuff. It's skyrocketing. And the serious things are just dwindling away. Dwindling away. I mean, most people you know could barely even name the vice president or the speaker of the house anymore. It's crazy what's happening. If you can even name the first president anymore. But they could tell you who Kim Kardashian is married to today. It's come down to this in social media. Reductionism and brevity. That spells it out perfectly right there. Even Twitter. A certain number of characters are all you were allowed. And what happens is we, if we're not careful, that can spill into the church. And it's like, come on, pastor, no 40-minute sermons, man. I can't handle that. Give me five and let me get out of there. I have a lot of cool videos going because that keeps my attention a lot better than whatever you have to say. Theology, are you kidding me? Yikes, I want nothing to do with that. Just give me the, the quick, you know, you got to invite Jesus in your heart and get saved. And let's do the altar call and get out of here. I mean, what about solid theology? We're, 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 we've lost it. We've lost it because we've tried to reduce it down and everything's about brevity. That's it. And then we see that in our Bible studies. We see that in our theology, right? All right, let's move on. Number seven. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. What that implies is that you are with people. You see, if I'm not with people, I don't need to endure them. If everyone around me I spend one minute with, I'm probably not going to have to endure them. Enduring someone is, is being close to someone, spending a lot of time with someone, having a conflict with someone, which you probably will, but knowing how to work through that conflict. Believing what they say, trusting them, hoping that things will get better, enduring, bearing with people. Social media doesn't help that in any way. If anything, it fosters what I call the absent but present syndrome. Everyone is present. We're all in the same house together. I heard stories about, I don't know if I mentioned this, I, I get confused when I say first service and when I say second service, but I've heard stories about families in the same house, they don't even talk anymore, they text each other. They're all together, they're all hanging out, they're all in the house, but they're not with each other, they're glued to their personal media accounts. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Number eight, Ephesians 5, 16 to 17 Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, for the days are evil. Social media, folks, if you are not, if you are not careful, can be a colossal waste of time on trivial stuff that doesn't matter. How fast you're on Facebook? Can an hour, if you're really into checking things out and commenting and going back and forth, how fast can an hour just fly by? Why is it that to spend an hour in the Word or an hour in prayer, wow, would seem like an eternity? But an hour on Facebook just flies by so quickly. And then you get done, you spend three and a half hours on Facebook, and you ask yourself, what did I just accomplish? Was, it re- was I really redeeming the time? Was I walking as someone that is wise, as the Scripture says? I mean, we can easily lose out on the practice of a disciplined life. We get caught up and we let the time just fly away from us. Where's the discipline? Where's the discipline? Number nine, Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said this, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. There is no such thing as just fire insurance, folks. There's no such thing as praying a prayer, and because you prayed a prayer, you're in. Coming to Jesus is clear. Denying self, taking up his cross, which means suffering, and following him as Lord of your life. That's the teaching of Scripture. But we are in such a society of self esteem and narcissism, and social media is a tremendous tool used by the evil one to fuel more of that. It becomes all about you. And we have churches that are established and are gathering thousands and thousands of people every Sunday to hear how great you are, not how great Jesus is. It's all about you. What is the motto of YouTube? You know it? Broadcast yourself. I mean, you can look at some people, and they are posting all the time. And you know every post has the same theme. It's me, me, me. Self-centeredness, self-promotion, the list goes on. My specialness, my greatness, my quest to to garner the praises of the masses. 
and especially for people in my generation on down, we have been pumped with the lie of self-esteem our entire lives, and now we finally found our outlet, haven't we? It's all about me. Folks, we are not that important. You got to tell yourself that because I need to tell myself that all the time. I'm not that special. I have died to self and Christ now dwells in me. He's the one that's special, not me. Last one, John 8, 36, great verse. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. If you're a Christian, you are free. You need to live as a free man or a free woman. Social media can put chains on you. It could bring you back to bondage. It could be addictive. How do you know it's addictive? I'll tell you right now. If that offended you, you're probably addicted to social media, okay? If someone came up to me and said, uh, you got a drug addiction, I'd be like, I'd laugh at it. Talk to my wife, talk to my kids, search my house. I got no drug addiction, I can promise you that. that. That was a silly thing to say about me. But if I was addicted to drugs and someone came up to me and said, you got a drug addiction, I'd get all defensive probably. So are you addicted to media? How do you know? Well, maybe, maybe checking your account too often, checking it during inappropriate hours of the day, like the very first thing you do when you get out of bed, the last thing you do before you go to sleep, the middle of the night, during the church service. How about talking to people online more than you talk to people face to face? How about allowing social media to interfere and trump other priorities that you should have in your life, like your time with the Lord, your time with others, your time at church, the things you should be doing at work and not checking your text messages and writing more text messages, responsibilities you have within the home. Is there an addiction there? No. Again, I'm going to repeat it. I study this out. I got a Facebook account. I don't plan to close it out this week. I don't use it very much, but I don't plan to close it out. And if you can understand these particular verses, and maybe you choose to use different ones, or you could even add more to this list probably. I don't want to keep you here all day. I just gave you 10. And you could use social media without violating those verses in your own heart. We are not to judge each other in this matter. Then may the Lord bless us. All I'm saying is think and process social media like everything else in, your, else in your life as a Christian, please, not as a pagan. MacArthur, John MacArthur said it best. He said, when so much about social media panders to pride and shameless self-exaltation, believers need to think about their motives before they jump on the bandwagon. If the goal is simply popularity or personal promotion, it's time to do a heart check. Our celebrity-driven culture craves for notoriety. But Christians are called to be different. We have died to ourselves. Thus, our concern should not be how many people can I get to follow me, but rather how can I bear witness to the wonder of following Christ. Let's go to the last thought on this subject here, and then we're going to wrap it up and go to the Lord's table. Um, I don't want to just leave it there. A lot of preachers do that, okay? Give you all the facts, you know, maybe the Spirit's working on your hearts right now. Hope he is. And then you're like, okay, what do I do? And I say, let's close in prayer and go home. I want to tell you what you can do. I want to to help you. I want to take you through some things that will help you if you have a problem in this area to overcome that problem and live a life that's more pleasing to Christ. And it doesn't just apply to social media. It applies to anything that could be pulling you away from a fervent relationship to Jesus. Is your social media a term of or dealt with in regards to overconsumption? Are you overly consumed with television, text messages, social media, whatever the case might be? Are you making improper selections as to the DVDs that you go out and buy and that you rent, things you download off the Internet? Do you have an addiction to any, any or, or some of the forms or sources of media? You see, folks, what we do is we, 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 we consider what we hear. We consider the Word of God. We think about these things, and we realize that maybe I need to make a change. What the Holy Spirit does is he convicts us of sin if we're a Christian. And maybe through the word of God and the things that I've shared and you've done some self-examination, which is a good thing, you're realizing that you have a big or a small problem in this area. And that's good. 
That's the first step toward recovery. That's the first step of repentance. But the question is, now that you realize maybe you need to make some changes, how do you make those changes? So here we go. Number one, confess to God that you need his help. If you hear all of this, and then you realize you got to go make some changes, and you do it based upon your own strength, you are acting like an unbeliever. Because even they'll come to that conclusion themselves. Do it through the strength that he supplies. That's number two then. Pray for his strength. If you really want to honor him, it's not just getting rid of, rid of the bad DVD, but it's allowing him to guide you to choose better DVDs. It's praising him for the choice that you made to get rid of that DVD, you see? Let him be part not only of the beginning, but the entire process. Let him be your life. But pray for his strength because these are strongholds. These are satanic strongholds that you have in your life, 2 Corinthians 10.4. And you can't break them necessarily completely on your own for the glory of God. I can pump you up. I can get you excited. I can get you to go do something right away. But the shelf life will probably be about two days. And that DVD you throw away today, you'll probably go back and buy again on Wednesday. Do it through Christ. Let him demolish those satanic strongholds in your life. Number three, get some accountability. Find one, maybe two, mature believers, not people that are going to tell you what you want to hear, mature believers that will hold you accountable to the decisions that you make and allow them the freedom to ask you some tough questions on a regular basis. Number four, devise a plan and put it into practice. Don't just say, i got to limit the use of social media. That's not going to get you anywhere. Don't just say I need to make better choices regarding the things I download off the Internet. Don't just say I need to send tech, less text messages. Don't just say I need to check my, my email account less often each day. Don't do that. That's not going to get you anywhere. Get specific. What specifically do you need to do? Develop a plan. Plan. What's your plan? How are you going to go about doing that? And in the Bible, we call that put-offs and put-ons. We put off the bad... We renew our mind, and we put on the good. That's what Ephesians 4, 22 to 20, 24 teaches us, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. In other words, when you were an unbeliever, you lived a certain way. Now that you're a believer, you don't need to live that way. You shouldn't want to live that way anymore. You laid it aside, right? Which is being corrupt in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We've been covering that. And that you put on the new self. You never put something off biblically and then leave a void because something bad biblically then will fill that void. You put off the old, that creates a void, and you put something good in that void. Well, what's good? The new self, which is renewed in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. How does God want you to act? What would God want you to watch? How often does God want you to do that? Is it holy? Is it truthful? That's how the Christian responds. So as far as putting off goes, what specifically needs to go? You ask yourself that question. What needs to go? Again, maybe all of you are involved in all of these things, and you're going to walk out and say, hey, that sermon was an encouragement to me because I feel like I'm walking with the Lord in that area. Praise God. I'm happy for you. Maybe some of you guys need to get a little bit more radical. How are you going to break the pattern? What's the plan? What's the plan? Oh, Pastor, you know, I I watch TV until the late hours of the evening. I put that thing on around 10 o'clock, and and I'm falling asleep in front of the television set at 2. That's a problem. Why are you going to break that? What's the plan? Maybe maybe an idea um, is just maybe get up earlier, and then maybe by 10 o'clock you're ready to go to bed. Maybe you're you're so involved with media, instead of starting your day with checking your Facebook account and your Twitter account and your emails and your text messages first thing in the morning, maybe, maybe this is a crazy idea, but maybe read the Bible first thing in the morning, right? Start your mind with something that's a little bit more noble and wholesome. Start your mind with your walk with the Lord. Maybe refuse to end your day with media. I mean, we're going to bed with our minds filled with this stuff. Maybe end it in conversation with your spouse, your kids. prayer. Maybe go on a media fast. Can you do that? That's a good test to see if you have an addiction. Just quit media across the board for one week. That's not asking too much. The world won't come to an end. 
Your friends on Facebook will still be there when you get back. Could you do that for one week? Just to get away from it? And let yourself, in a sense, decompress from this overload of stimulus that we have pumping into our minds and the minds of our kids especially? Maybe you're saying, I can't do any of that. Well, then maybe you need to get a little radical, like amputate the sin. Remember Jesus talked about that. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off in Matthew chapter 5, right? He wasn't talking about literal eyes and hands. He's talking about sin in our life that we just need to get rid of. Maybe you need to get rid of the television set. Maybe you need to get rid of the remote control. Because it makes it a little harder then to surf through the channels, right? Maybe you need to get rid of your internet service. You kidding me? Internet? No way. I can't get rid of that. If you can't stop downloading pornography from the internet, which is a huge problem within the church, generally speaking, Jesus would tell you, if all else fails, get rid of the internet service. That's better than to fall headlong into sin, right? You need to quit the Facebook account altogether because it's got control over you. It's controlling you more than you're controlling it, right? So you put it off. I don't know what that is for you. I can't tell you. I'm not your judge in these matters. You put it off. It's sin. And you renew your mind. You put on. What do you put on? You put on things now that will fill that void where the media once was. Like, how about spending time with the Lord? How about coming out to prayer meeting on Wednesday nights? How about reading your Bible? How about praying? Ocean Grove, the last three days this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. What a blessing. Wasn't that awesome, folks? Some of you guys came out. How could you? I don't get that. Where You you got the summer. You could bring your family out. You could teach your kids that. It's not just Sunday morning, Wednesday nights that we do church. You know, it's, it's 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 a lifestyle for us. Hang around other believers. What a wholesome time that was. Great music. Beautiful environment. Do stuff like that. It's going to get you further spiritually than some television show. Read a book. Exercise. Do some wholesome things with your family. You know, I can't stand up here and tell you that I used to walk three miles every single day, uphill. (laughs) Both ways uphill. Never figured that one out. In the snow to get to school. But I can tell you, when I was a kid, I used to actually have to get up off the couch to change the channels that the television said. Did you know that? (laughs) And when I was growing up as a kid, we didn't have a VCR. We didn't get a VCR until I was in college. Video games, you know, the Atari, like, One Step Beyond Pong. Remember that from last week? I was in high school, I think, freshman maybe, when that came out. We didn't have cable TV. We didn't have personal computers. You know, maybe we missed out on a lot. It's hard to imagine life without any of that stuff. But as I grew up in my unbelieving, uh, dysfunctional family, we made time to be together. For the most part, we always ate dinners together. Unbelieving family. We would do things as a family that were fun. We'd have conversations that were wholesome and encouraging. And I think, folks, we've lost that. We've lost in our generation face-to-face time together. And I'm not just talking about quality time. I'm talking about quantity time. With family and with brothers and sisters in Christ especially. There's no substitute for that. Media can never replace that. I mean, I find it interesting that when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, he made it a point, that great letter to the Romans, of that letter at the very beginning to say this, I long to see you. so that I could be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. And the Apostle John, same thing, when he was writing a letter and communicating to God's people, said, though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do that with paper and ink. I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. I think we've lost the value, folks, of being together. We've lost the value of being together as God's people simply oftentimes due to media. And if we've lost the value of being together as God's people, we have lost the value of being a Christian. And that, as we get ready for the Lord's table, it comes down to that. That the problem, as I just meditated on this and really put a lot of thought into it last night, the problem isn't necessarily with the media. The problem is with Christ. 
It's not a media problem, folks. It's a Jesus problem. Because I believe with all my heart that if we are truly feeding our souls upon his grace and his glory, if we are truly in worshipful awe around the clock of his wisdom and his power, if we are spiritually stunned by his faithfulness and love for us, if we are daily motivated by his presence and his promises, we won't settle for second-right pleasures of media that we think will satisfy our hearts. It's a war going on. And it's a war for the pursuit of glory. And media holds up blinking billboards saying, I am going to make you happy. I'm going to make you satisfied. I'm going to thrill your soul. And that is a good thing. It's only that media is not to be the source where we're to find that stuff. That's a shadow of glory. We can have the substance of glory, which is Jesus Christ himself. Does he anymore captivate your hearts? Man, we have been seduced, we have been deceived, and we have been distracted. And I think that's why there are so many people in the professing church that are hurt, that are angry, that are empty, and are confused. Because they've run after all these temporary thrills that promise satisfaction, and it has blown up in their faces. And like sand, it has sifted through their fingertips. Only Jesus, folks, can give you what your heart truly desires because he's built that heart in such a way that only he can fill that void. And too often we are no different than the world. We are looking horizontally at that screen when Jesus offers us, offers us pleasures far beyond anything Mita can give us vertically from above. Colossians 3, I was meditating this morning. Set your mind on the things above where Christ is. And you are seated at the right hand of God. Regardless, folks, brothers and sisters, of what you do with media, that's your decision and that is between you and the Lord. But don't let it be a substitute for the excitement and the thrill and the satisfaction and the purpose that only Jesus Christ can give you. Don't commit idolatry. Your God is with you. Worship him with all your heart. That's your television screen. Father, we pray that you would help us to have a biblical mind to make decisions that are wise and glorifying to you. And as we partake of the Lord's table right now, this is a reminder, Lord, of your love for us, your care for us, your concern for us. This is a reminder, Lord, that you had paid the ultimate price that we could be your children that, Lord, you've redeemed us not to just get to heaven and do whatever we want, but you've redeemed us with a purpose that we might be your sons and your daughters, that we might proclaim, as it says in Scripture, the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Help us to walk, Lord, as children of the light, not children of darkness. Help us to be involved in the things that are truthful, noble, honoring, praiseworthy. Help us to be people, Lord, that glory in the cross and find our thrill first and foremost in you and then use these sources and avenues of media as a tool to grow in our walk and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to get excited more about you than anything else, all those lesser gods that promise us joy and never fully deliver. If there's anyone here without Christ, I pray that they allow these elements of the body and the blood to pass by because the Bible says they're eating and drinking judgment to themselves. Lord, if we are a Christian or maybe even right now we've given our lives to Christ, maybe right now we realize that I think like an unbeliever. Right now I realize that I am so seduced by the things of this world that even though I called myself a Christian, I am far from ever acting like one. Maybe right now we come to realize that we are sinners and Jesus Christ has never truly covered us has never poured out his blood in that sense to cover our sins and given us atonement. And right now we need to come to Christ. Maybe that's the first thing we need to do. We give Jesus our lives. I pray right now if there's anyone here that they would just simply, in the submissiveness of their own heart, acknowledge that they're a sinner. I mean, even regarding media, Lord, we see our sins even as believers. All of us are guilty. 
And Lord, that we need forgiveness and only Christ brings that forgiveness and that we would embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord of our lives by faith alone. And Lord, if that's the case, if someone has given their life to Christ, we pray right now that they would partake of this feast. This is for not self-righteous Christians. This is not for people that try to earn their way to heaven. This is for people who are spiritually bankrupt, realize they have nothing to contribute, and are casting themselves entirely, 100% at the foot of the cross. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you will minister to us all, whether we've been saved for one minute or dozens of years. Minister to us and encourage our hearts through the body and the blood of Christ. Help us to contemplate, focus, do some good self-examination during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.